Today, I'm going to talk to you about what wellness is and what it means by sustainable wellness. And uh, uh, that, that means there are things that we need to look at uh, in, in terms of maintaining uh, our, our health and wellness. Um, there are key aspects of health and wellness that we need to look into uh, that, are, that are crucial, that are vital for maintaining our health and wellness. Now, as per the uh, World Health Organization definition of health and wellness, it is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And not just merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, that's quite deep. Because in my 25 years of medical practice, what I have encountered is we doctors, we are great for producing wellness for our patients who avidly listens to us. They, uh, our words are so powerful that they are willing to make significant changes. Now, there is one problem though. We are all busy clinicians and quite often in our clinical setting, we find it quite difficult to put in, put in the time that is required to get into depth of understanding our patients. And this is, this is quite often uh, a major aspect of, of our consultations that, that is going to make changes in a person's life, a sustainable change in a person's life, which we are unable to do because of various factors. Now, uh, in fact, to achieve this state of complete wellness, it does not just require the medications that we are going to give them. We need to look at the person's life in detail, the lifestyle that they are leading. And large proportion of primary care provider visits are in fact related to stress and lifestyle. The fact is that when people are stressed and overwhelmed, they are less likely to engage in healthy behaviors. Now, these healthy behaviors are the ones that actually gets them out of this stressed and unhealthy stage in their life. But they don't. They don't because uh, of various factors that they are they're, they're going through in their life. Now, this is where we need to understand what we need to do in terms of attaining this wellness. So the most important aspect of this is effective stress management. Now, when I talk about effective stress management, this is not that easy. This is because we have needs that are not just in one area of our life. We have needs that are in different aspects of our life, which includes our physical needs, which needs to be taken care of. We need the energy level to meet and sustain the energy to, to do our routine activities in life. We need to function. We need to function at work. We need to function socially. We need enough energy left in us to deal with emergencies in life. And we need enough energy to even do the leisure activities that are going to keep us healthy. And do we have that? Yes, we will have it if we are maintaining our fitness level, the physical fitness, which is an important aspect of this. But do we have that? Do, do most of us have that? We need to think about that. The emotional needs, the, we all need to feel that we are loved, we are accepted and that need keeps us moving forward to do certain things in our life which people accept us or not, okay? So we need to support this emotional need that we have and our social needs. We are, we are social beings. We have these mirror neurons which makes us instantly recognize what the other person uh, sitting and talking to us is, is, is expressing. And we react based on that. And we need to be approved by the society that we are dealing with, that we are interacting with. We have other needs that includes occupational, financial, intellectual needs. If we are not accepted by the people who are associating with us, then we are not uh, satisfied. 
the spiritual needs and environmental needs. So interacting all of these and how they are, 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 are forming a balance in our life is, is, is extremely important. If we are able to put a balance to all these things, it's much easier to deal with the stresses that we experience in life. So how do we achieve this? At Retrieve, what we plan to do is to go in detail and understand the level of stress, understand the stress that each person is going through, examine their sleep habits, their dietary habits, their physical activity level, their various nature of addictions that they are indulging in, the psychoactive substance usages, the social connectivity, all these things that, that keep a person uh, balanced or, or unbalanced in life. So we build effective relationships with our clients and we offer stage matched interventions using uh, approaches such as setting smart goals. Keep the goals very specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time framed. And our specific approach would be to empower our clients. Now, we are not going to be in the driver's seat. Our clients need to be in the driver's seat. They are the ones who have to take the onus of their wellness. They have to drive their wellness forward. We will enable them. Uh, and we conduct group workshops for these. We have cognitive behavioral therapy approaches and approaches of positive psychology and building social support groups for these. And we change, we change things for our clients in such a way that they improve their self-confidence, their motivation level, their autonomy, and enhance the resilience. Now, resilience is extremely important in balancing things in your life because there are going to be incredible difficulties and challenges in life at various points. And you need to learn to be resilient so that you can move forward without losing your balance. Uh, you need to undo the negative feelings and instill positive emotions into your mind. The end result is the ability to manage stress effectively, healthier sleep habits, healthier dietary habits, optimal level of physical activity, ability to manage your addictive behaviors, and the optimal level of social connectivity. Now, moving on, to the second pillar of sustainable wellness. This is maintaining physical fitness. Now, one of the biggest problems that everybody is facing, and this is, this is massive in terms of how widespread this is, is sedentary behaviors. Dr. Paul Putaran touched upon it, and this is one of the big reasons for people's health deteriorating. It's a distinct class of behavior and it has specific determinants and effects on disease risk. It independently increases the disease risk despite having adequate leisure time activities. And there are studies that are done on this and uh, what they have seen. Van der Plog in 2012 examined this in, in uh, uh, almost 200,000 uh, people aged 45 or older and followed up for about 2.8 years, they saw that around 6.9% of all cause mortality was attributed to sitting alone. And this was an independent risk factor irrespective of adequate level of physical activity. Now that's very significant. Now this was consistent across all ages, gender, BMI, the physical activity level, healthy participants compared to people who have pre-existing cardiovascular or diabetes, cardiovascular disease or diabetes mellitus. And uh, looking at it further, there are people who studied the uh, behavior such as watching television, which how it influences sedentary behaviors and health. And uh, they saw that television watching itself is particularly a risk where People uh, exhibit behaviors such as unhealthy eating habits along with uh, uh, prolonged sitting time during the television watching. And this, in fact, increases the hazard ratio of all-cause mortality even higher, like 1.5 of hazard ratio. In spite of getting adequate exercise, 
in spite of people having even up to seven hours of exercise per week, it independently increases the mortality risk. Now, these are very significant and this is, these are things that anyone can take care of as well. Uh, and physical inactivity is, uh, in fact, a cause of one in ten premature deaths. And if worldwide physical inactivity can be reduced by 25 percent, 1.3 million deaths could be averted every year. This is what they found by Lee et al. studied uh, the physical inactivity and all-cause mortality and published this in Lancet in 2012. And this is uh, very significant for us to understand and change. So the overall benefits of physical activity is higher health-related fitness, higher control and maintenance of healthy weight, lower risk of disabling medical conditions and less chronic disease rates, uh, especially compared to people who are inactive. Uh, within weeks of starting regular exercise, your physical function scores improve you get better weight management and your risk of diseases start decreasing such as diseases uh, of, such as dementia, cognitive decline, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, osteoarthritis and certain types of cancers such as breast, lungs, colon, um, stomach and all. Now, in 2013, there was a, there was a study, uh, which was a meta-epidemiological -epidemio study, which came in the British Medical Journal. They looked at 16 meta-analyses, around 305 RCTs, which included around 339,000 participants. And what they saw was exercise is better than medication in the post-stroke treatment, it is equivalent to medication as secondary prevention of coronary artery disease and pre-diabetes. And exercise, in fact, has improved side effect profile compared to medications, although it is best in combination with medications. In 2011, Woodcock et al. conducted a study which looked at non-vigorous physical activity and how it can reduce all-cause mortality. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of, uh, of, of, this was a study which looked at 22 uh, uh, studies and, and conducted as a systematic review and meta-analysis. And they found that um, uh, 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, in fact, reduced the mortality risk by 19%. 19%. All you need to do is 2.5 hours of moderate intensity exercise per week. And if you can, in fact, increase that to 420 minutes, which is about seven hours, you're going to reduce your mortality risk by 24%. Based on this, the current recommendation for physical activity is to have at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity or an equivalent combination. So that would equate to about 30 minutes of moderate intensity, a brisk walking or something of that sort for five days a week, which is something anyone can manage. Moving on to the third pillar of sustainable wellness, which was the effective nutritional management. Now, uh, in 1950, 1982, Dr. Dennis Burkett wrote a landmark article about Western diseases and their emergence related to diet. The conclusion of this article was that the 21st century lifestyle related particularly to diet was the cause of most of the diseases of the of, uh, 21st century. He proposed dietary changes to prevent these and treat these diseases. Further on in 1987, along with Dr. Trowell, they wrote an article about the development of the, of the development of the concept of dietary fiber. During the Industrial Revolution, fiber was taken out of flour due to the belief that dietary fiber was a gastric irritant. Now in place of the dietary fiber, they, 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 they put uh, more animal products, salt and sugar, and the end result has been an increase in the incidence and prevalence of lifestyle diseases. 
So when you look at the nutritional management, what you need to understand is there are certain category of over-consumed foods, particularly coming from the Western world, which is now adapted in our parts of the world. These are the added sugars, the high fructose corn syrup based uh, foods, cholesterol, saturated fat, sodium, trans fats, processed grains, and high calorie food. Now they have to be significantly reduced in consumption. The next one is the shortfall nutrients. Now when you say shortfall nutrients, they are the nutrients that are not adequately consumed by at least 25% of the population. Now these include calcium, fiber, magnesium, potassium, vitamin A, C, D, E, and K. You have to sufficiently have an intake of these shortfall nutrients to keep your health in balance. Now what are the type of foods that give you this? Uh, in descending order, that would be Number one, vegetables, including mushrooms, herbs and spices, fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. You can see that none of the animal products are coming in this. Now, uh, this has to be a major change as part of nutri nutritional management uh, of our lifestyle. Now, some of the evidence-based dietary programs include the Onish diet. They have extensively, Dean Onish, uh, an American doctor, has extensively looked into the effect of uh, lifestyle, intensive lifestyle management with effective dietary management into the treatment and in fact reversal of certain conditions. And he has found that it is very effective in coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, obesity and some type of cancers like prostate cancer. Uh, the other ones are Esselstyn plant-based diet, which, is, which has some evidence base for coronary artery disease, the DASH diet for hypertension, the portfolio diet for hypercholesterolemia. The general principles on food includes, think holistically about food packages. You could have an excellent source of calcium by drinking milk, dairy products, but is that all that it is? Calcium is not just a source, uh, milk is not just a source of calcium, but it is also a source of saturated fat. So you need to look at that as well when you consider the nutrient value of certain foods. You need to consider the food package. And you need to think of it as a whole food rather than, uh, you know, you have to consume whole food. For example, an apple is certainly a better food than an apple tart or an apple juice where it's going to lose most of its nutrient value and starts having more over-consumed nutrients. So uh, the, the, the centering the diet on whole uh, plant-based food is going to be crucial. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's what Michael Pollan said in his book. Eat food means unprocessed and natural not too much means keep it appropriate portion sizes and mostly keep it plant-based. Eat, eat a rainbow every day. Variety of plant foods with different colors tend to have uh, flavonoids and the vitamins which are essential to health and disease prevention. Supplements are not going to replace what the food is going to give us. So we need to keep our food healthy, not just add supplements. A wide variety of plant foods help us meet the daily requirements of macronutrients and micronutrients. You begin by eating vegetable fruits and then add herbs and spices. Now one very important point that I need to talk about is the method of food preparation and how it influences the formation of advanced glycation end products which is now known as a major factor for oxidative stress and inflammation and uh, a, a, a main factor for disease formation. This is formed by a spontaneous chemical reaction between amino acids and monosaccharides such as glucose. And it, it tends to occur more in protein-rich food which is cooked in higher temperatures and high heat applied for longer period of time. Dry food, the more dry you keep the food, the more AG formation is there. And the more basic or acidic the food is, that is also going to influence the formation of AGEs. And uh, it increases over time 
although the body can detoxify it it processes them very slowly so it builds up in cells in our body that have long life like the nerve cells the brain cells the blood vessels and the, and the eye cells so it tends to uh, directly uh, affect and and it is related to diseases such as diabetes atherosclerosis kidney disease uh, slow wound healing um, dementia and uh, uh, cataracts and, and and diseases such as these in t in 2014 who looked at the prevalence of diabetes which was about 422 million which is a prevalence of about 8.5 percent now this was a rapid rise from 1980 which was only about 108 million but if you look at the prevalence but in percentage it was only 4.7 percent so you can see that it's almost double in 2014 that's in spite of all the technology advancement and all the excellent developments that has happened in the field of medicine uh, uh, we still fail to uh, stop the prevalence of diabetes or reduce the prevalence of diabetes uh, and this is largely due to the lifestyle factors because diabetes type 2 diabetes is clearly a lifestyle disease and in 2025 they have WHO has project projected the incidence of diabetes to rise by 109% in Africa and 96% in the Middle East and globally it's said to increase by 55%. Now diet is a cornerstone of di type 2 diabetes control uh, treatment and reversal. Any diabetologist or endocrinologist here would admit that. Uh, and uh, exercise can help significantly and stress management can help significantly. Cardiovascular disease is common in the Western civilization with diets that are high in fats. Whereas in civilizations that used to follow diets that are plant-based and low in fat, it was almost non-existent. But that was the past. Things have changed now. The civilizations which used to follow these low-fat plant-based diet are now getting influenced by the westernization and their diets are changing and the incidence of lifestyle diseases are increasing in these parts of the world like the places like Uganda, the South African Bantu population, the rural China. They, these used to be non-existent in these civilizations but now the incidence are increasing. Moving on to the fourth pillar of sustainable wellness which is maintaining social connectivity. Now when we say social connectivity the important aspect is that we need to remain positive about the people that we are interacting with. Now, it's impossible that everyone will give positive vibes for you. There are going to be uh, feedbacks that you experience. Remember, I told you that we are social beings and we have plenty of these mirror neurons and, and we are going to identify reactions from people which we may not like. And if we are going to react to that, it is going to affect our stress level. We are going to be influenced by that. And we stop enjoying life. We stop finding joy, interest, and contentment in life. And we stop loving life. We need to change this. We need to instill the positive aspects of life. And we need to put positive psychology into our mind. And put joy, interest, contentment, pride, and love. We need to share our successes. We need to enjoy other people's successes as well. And we need to move forward uh, with our wellness. The fifth pillar of sustainable wellness is effective addiction management. Now, when I talk about addiction, it is not only tobacco and alcohol that I mean. There is a new kind of addiction that is developing in the world, especially with the younger generation, which is addiction to technology. That has to be managed as well. When we talk about tobacco and alcohol addiction, the harmful effects of tobacco and alcohol, I don't need to talk about that to you, all of you. You know probably much more than me about all the harmful effects of tobacco and alcohol. But there are effective ways of managing this, and it has to be managed if we are going to achieve uh, uh, a wellness that is going to be sustained in our life. Now, there are medications. If counseling is not, uh, co there are several ways uh, that we can address uh, the addiction behaviors through counseling, through cognitive behavioral therapy, through motivational interviewing, 
uh, and in, in, in and 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 workshops, group workshops. Uh, there are very very useful tools that we have to manage this. Now, if in case they are not as effective as we want, we still have medications that are going to help significantly, like the nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion for smoking cessation, valinicline, uh, which can be used in dosages of 0.5 milligrams once daily and eventually increased up to 1 milligram twice daily and continued for 24 weeks. For alcohol uh, management, there is naltrexone, which can be used at 50 milligrams uh, once or twice daily. There is acamprosate, disulfiram, gabapentin. These are all very effective ways of managing the alcohol dependence. And as I said, the technology addiction clearly has to be managed as well. And particularly, we need to educate the younger generation who are now very vulnerable. The technology addiction is not just going to affect uh, uh, the, 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 the regular aspects of what technology is bringing into their life, but it's also going to induce sedentary behaviors into a child's life. And if we are indulging in that, it is going to induce sedentary behaviors into our lives. And sometimes we doctors are also at risk of these sedentary behaviors, which we need to make changes about. Now, this is what it really is, the five pillars of sustainable wellness. They're all equally important, but effective stress management is the key to keeping all these pillars together. We need to maintain the physical fitness. We need to effectively manage the nutritional. We need to maintain the social connectivity. We need to manage our substance usages and addictive behaviors effectively. Now, finally, let me touch a little bit upon epigenetics and uh, how it's related to lifestyle. Now, genes are what we are driven by from birth. But it's not only the genes that influences us. There are non-DNA sequence components that act like gene switches that modify and control the gene expression through DNA methylation microRNAs, histone acetylation, and a growing number of other molecular changes. The maternal diet is strongly correlated with adiposity and metabolic syndromes in her children. If mothers are eating a diet that is low in plants, they're going to lack the methylation capacity, which is extremely important. And methyl groups come through plant foods and B vitamins. So. If a diet by the parents are going to be poor, it is clearly going to affect, be passed on, the, the epigenetics of that is going to be passed on to the offsprings. So you can change your lifestyle and change the way your genes behave. You can turn on the protective genes and turn off the genes that promote the inflammation, oxidative stress, and oncogenesis. In addition, the healthy lifestyle changes and lengthens the telomeres. Telomeres are the protective caps to our DNAs, and that tends to help us with our aging process. So overall, the key influences of epigenetics are the diet, exercise, sleep, and obesity. And the positive influences that help stabilize the epigenome are the polyphenols, B vitamins, exercise, stress reduction, healthy maternal and paternal diet. And the negative influences include sugar, alcohol, saturated fat, and processed food. Finally, your genes are not your destiny, but your lifestyle is. The changes that you make today will change your lifestyle and ultimately your future. Our slogan for wellness at Retrieve is reclaim what was once yours, retain what is now yours, and remove what may become yours. That means we were all healthy at some point. We were all at some point being well. We will help you reclaim that wellness that you lost. Retain what is good in you at the moment. And we will help you address that. And keep what is good for you. And remove what may become yours. Which are the diseases that may become yours if you are not careful. And we will help you address these. And help you stay well and sustain the wellness. These are our services. If any of you are interested in finding out more about our services, our staff are very happy to help you out with those queries. 
And these are our uh, details. We have a website, Facebook page, and Instagram presence. And please visit our website and Instagram and Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you.